Cool. Welcome to the first annual Rocky Mountain Humanistic Counseling and Psychological Association Conference. We're going to have a test at the end. If you can say all of that without stuttering, you get an extra award or something. But uh, uh, we're very excited to have our first conference. We're a fairly new organization. We started just a year and a half ago. And our goal is really to develop a, a strong humanistic community in the Rocky Mountains. Uh, to provide a lot of good training opportunities, mentoring opportunities here in the Rocky Mountains. And uh, so this is our, our first conference and one of our first uh, continuing education events that we've been able to, to offer. And we're hoping to offer a lot more. We're, we're hoping our this conference originally was going to be in the fall, which is when our conference will usually be. And we're hoping to have our second one this coming fall, uh, probably in Colorado Springs for our second one. So we're, we're excited to have you here, we're excited for a good turnout for this, despite the, the weather outside. So thank you for braving, braving the weather uh, to come and join us. Um, my name is Lewis Hoffman, I'm the, the president of the Rocky Mountain Humanistic Counseling and Psychological Association. Ian, can you say your last name? Uh, we're from Sacra, but just call me Ian. <laughs> I've been working on his last name for uh, probably four or five years now and I still can't say it. It took me till fourth grade. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Ian is our uh, president-elect, and we do have a couple other board members here. Uh, Carla is our secretary. Lisa is one of our members at large. We have a few people that weren't able to, to make it here today. But uh, we hope that you, if you're not a member, that you consider joining and becoming a part of our organization. We really want it to be a very member-focused creating a lot of membership opportunities and a lot of opportunities for community. That's really important to us. That's part of the humanistic spirit, is to have strong community. Uh, here's one of our other board members, actually now, Luis, uh, Luis Vargas, is also one of our board members. So if you're not a member, please consider joining. It's, we're, we're committed to keeping our uh, membership costs very low, uh, and our prices very low, and our, the benefits of membership strong. So uh, we hope you consider being part of us. So my uh, talk this morning is Reconsidering Humanistic Psychology for the, for the 21st Century. Now I'm going to try and cover a number of things that I see, certainly not a comprehensive list, but a number of things that I think is, is vital as we think about humanistic psychology moving into the 21st century. What do we have to do for humanistic psychology to survive, to remain strong, and to remain a force? It's often referred to as the third force in psychology. In recent years, uh, some have questioned whether it's really remained a force. And uh, I think over the last 10 years, there's a lot of evidence it has, which I'll talk about some. But we want to make sure that it remains a force, and we hope that the Rocky Mountain region is a big part of keeping humanistic psychology a strong force in psychology. So these are some of the things that I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, and these are the, the outcomes that you'll have. I'm going to just skip over those. But my, uh, my goal is really to talk about how humanistic psychology can remain relevant in, psych in a force in psychology and contemporary culture. And right now, when you look at what's happening in our culture today, we really need humanistic psychology. It's a very polarized time in our country, uh, and it's a time where we see a lot of very disheartening things happening. And humanistic psychology can be an important healing force in that, an important force in bringing love and compassion uh, to psychology and to our culture, which we, we need in this time of division. So that's one of the things that I hope to illustrate through this presentation, is how we can be a part of that. But I want to start by talking about some of our failures. In order to grow, we need to look at what have we done wrong, what has not worked in humanistic psychology. I think that's very important. One of the criticisms that was being said for quite a while, and I think there's quite a bit of fairness in this, though it's not completely true, is that we weren't saying anything new. We kept restating what Rogers and Maslow and all these other great, really important thinkers were saying. But we weren't applying it to anything new. We weren't advancing it. It, it had kind of grown stagnant. Uh, again, I think there were some places where that really was not true as well. There was some, there's always been some interesting new things going on, but it was not being heard or seen beyond humanistic psychology. So this is one of the things that we have to change if humanistic psychology is going to stay strong. It's relevant. We've got to speak to some different issues. And we've got to really critically think about who we've always said we are and what we're going to be. Not addressing contemporary issues. And this, I think, has been a, a fair criticism from early on. 
that humanistic psychology was growing and popular right around the time of the Civil Rights Movement. Yet there was this big distinction between the Civil Rights Movement and humanistic psychology. It didn't get very involved in it. I think that was a big failure. And it's probably part of the reasons why some people have had difficulty trusting humanistic psychology. Now, there were a lot of humanistic psychologists that were a part of it, but they kept it separate from their work. And so I think we do need to speak to contemporary issues, find ways to do that. That's vital for us if we're going to stay relevant and influencing our culture. I think there's also been times when we've been rebelling too quickly. Humanistic psychologists often are thought of as people that are really nice, which is an oversimplification. Um, but that's the caricature that a lot of times people give of humanistic psychology. But if you look at the history of humanistic psychology and the, the founders of humanistic psychology, they were rebels. They were willing to speak out. They were willing to say difficult things. Even Carl Rogers, who often, that's often missed as part of Carl Rogers, but they were willing to speak to some of the difficult issues. And there was, there's always been a rebellion spirit. You've got to be to be outside of mainstream and to, to be as successful as what humanistic psychology has been. There's got to be a bit of rebellion in there. But at times, humanistic psychology has rebelled too quickly and it's made us look bad. There have been a number of times, even in the last 10 years, where humanistic psychology has spoken out really strongly against something before really understanding it. So we've got to engage contemporary culture and what's happening in mainstream psychology and understand it well enough before we critique it. If we critique before we understand, then we, we don't look very good and we lose our influence. A big one is we've not embraced diversity and multiculturalism. And this was a huge failure. It started back with uh, the civil rights movement. And it's something that has started to change a little bit more over the last 10 years. There's a num been a number of attempts prior to that to try to change this, but they weren't successful in mounting enough momentum really to change that. But in the last 10 years, this has really started to change, whereas now we're starting to see uh, a lot more being written about this at a lot of the conferences and some of the most popular presentations. So uh, this is something that has to change. And uh, one of the reasons why we've not been a force. And then the misrepresentation of humanistic psychology. Just a couple of weeks ago, a student of mine who's teaching an intro to psychology textbook uh, te uh, emailed me a picture of what was in our introductory to psychology textbook about humanistic psychology. Two paragraphs was all that was in there. And within that, there was five factual errors. That's kind of astounding that you can get that many factual errors in two paragraphs for one. But this is a, an undergraduate textbook, and this has been a problem. Teaching at a, an institution, well, teaching various places, and uh, teaching about humanistic and existential psychology, one of the things that I've often found is in order to teach, you often have to unteach. Because there's so many inaccuracies that people have been taught in their undergraduate programs. So I also think we need a lot more people that identify as humanistic, existential, transpersonal teaching in undergraduate programs. That's something that's going to help change this as well. So some of the places where we can see that there has been a renewal, this has occurred. We've seen humanistic psychology show its force in recent years quite strongly. Now, I think in the diversity is one of them. And last year at APA you could really see this. Last year was the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King Jr.'s speech to APA, which is a wonderful speech that talked about creative maladjustment. It's a beautiful humanistic idea. I love that idea. I expected there'd be all kinds of programming on this at APA. There was hardly anything, and pretty much the only things done, even acknowledging this at APA, was put on by the Society for Humanistic Psychology. Richard Barkill did a documentary on, on the speech, and there's a number of other events. Uh, Lisa Vallejo, along with Sean Rubin and David St. John, did a presentation to a packed room on, I think it was on building or becoming allies, was a lot of the focus. And it drew even attention from people on APA Council. So humanistic psychology started to be seen as a force, as an advocate that can be counted on. So we've gone from where this was a weakness to where it's becoming a strength. I still think we've got a lot of work to do in this, but it's becoming a strength. The Society for Humanistic Psychology also led the way in bringing concerns about the DSM-5. And they had an open letter that they created on this that had, I don't even remember how many signatures it had at this point. 
but it also had a number of professional organizations, the British Psychological Association, the American Counseling Association, a number of divisions of APA that signed on to this letter, voicing concerns about the DSM-5, and hosted an alternatives, uh, to di uh, alternatives and Diagnosis Summit as well. This was something that gained enough momentum that, it, that the American Psychiatric Association felt that they needed to respond to it. So it is something that has made an important difference. We've seen humanistic psychology take on Big Pharma. Brent Robbins has been one of the leading voices in this, bringing concerns about over-medicating, prematurely medicating people instead of giving therapy a chance. And there's been some great work going on there. There's been some uh, good work taking on APA on therapeutic monoculture. And what we mean by therapeutic monoculture is that what we see represented in uh, the field of psychotherapy, a very limited range of the different therapeutic approaches being represented. And within the APA accredited programs, uh, I believe it's over 80%, maybe it's even over 90%, Rick Snyder will quote this often, of the, of the faculty of APA accredited psychology programs identify as CBT. Nothing wrong with CBT, I think it's got an important place in the field, but that that has become the culture that that's what so many people identify with. That's problematic. And there's been some research showing that the effectiveness of CBT has declined. There's also been some research that shows when there is only one therapeutic option out there that it doesn't benefit the clients. So this is something that needs to change and in humanistic psychology is taking a leading voice on it. It was very influential also in challenging the APA on the enhanced interrogations and torture, which is something that uh, really created a lot of uh, problems for APA for a number of years. And then also psychedelic research, which Carla will be presenting on later today, that being, uh, having the courage to look at some things that so much of the field has been ignoring. So there's still some needs. We need to continue to deepen our embracement of multiculturalism. Uh, we need to move beyond some of the divides. That was one of the, the things that we were very intentional about when we had our first meeting about forming the Rocky Mountain Humanistic Counseling and Psychological Association. And you can also blame it for why we have a name that's so difficult to say. <laughs> we felt it was important to have psychology and counseling together. These so often are divided. And there's uh, increasingly trying to distinguish these two fields. But and there are differences. But there's so much that we do that is the same, so much that overlaps. It doesn't make sense, and it doesn't serve our clients well when we're fighting with each other over territory instead of working together to try and best meet the needs of our clients. This is one of my big frustrations in the field of mental health is that we, we, we build barriers and we argue amongst ourselves over things that's really just about our egos and our territories and our job security. It's not about our clients. We need to put our clients first. That's vital for for the field, and I think humanistic psychology needs to lead the way in doing that. We need to bridge build with allies. There are a lot of other approaches and, and uh, emergent ideas that fit well with humanistic psychology. We need to build allyship with them instead of just focusing on the differences and critiquing. We need to embrace the contemporary issues as I've discussed. We need to clarify humanistic psychology. And one of the things that uh, I'm hoping we, we see more is when we find textbooks like the one that I referred to earlier, that we write the publisher, we write the author and say, hey, you know, you might want to do a little uh, clarification in the next edition. And provide some resources for them to be able to do that. Humanistic psychology was presented there as basically a cognitive approach to therapy. Which, in this textbook, which is kind of astounding. How do you read humanistic psychology and get that? That's uh, pretty strange. Community. This is something that for many years I've found uh, to be so important. When I first started in the field and identified as an existential therapist, I didn't know anyone else that identified as an existential therapist. It was years before I did. And as I started finding community in the Society of Humanistic Psychology and other places, what I kept hearing is everyone else had the same experience. They didn't know anyone else that identified like what they did. Now, if you're in Boulder, you can find other people that are transpersonal and humanistic. And, uh, and some other places. There's so many people that just feel isolated. And they're in places where they're the only person that's not CBT, they're the only person that's humanistic or existential or transpersonal. We need the community to nourish people that are in those contexts so that 
they have a place to go when they're feeling beat down by people that don't understand and respect humanistic psychology so that they can stay firm in their values. And this is one of the reasons, again, why we wanted to create this organization. But the local organizations, while we need to build a community here and nourish people locally, which I think is very important in creating energy, creating new thinking, we also need to connect with the national and even international organizations as well. We don't want to just speak to ourselves in Colorado. We want to do good work here, but then spread that out through connecting with other organizations. And we have an opportunity to do that in March when the Society for Humanistic Psychology Conference is going to be here in Boulder at Naropa University. Hopefully many of you will come and be a part of that as well. So connecting to the, to the, the uh, national and international, we need organizations like this that are doing this. We can help attract people to humanistic psychology. There's a lot of people that are drawn to it, but they don't understand it well enough really to identify with it. One of our award speakers tonight, uh, she's going to talk a little bit about how she was, she realized late in her career that she'd always been an existential therapist and just never really identified as that because she never knew enough about it. We need to change that. We need the support as I mentioned before, and we need to speak to the local needs. There's needs in the Colorado community that are going to be unique, but also connect with the broader community beyond Colorado. I'm just going to mention this, but not go into it much. Ian is much more of an expert in this area, and I think we'll talk about it some, uh, and it regularly does in this presentation, but the, the neural revolution is very important in the field of psychology. And a lot of people in humanistic psychology just ignore it. So that's, that's different than who we are. We don't need to talk about it. But I think there are ways that we can dialogue. It is possible to engage with neuropsychology without becoming reductionistic. And we need voices that are doing this. As Ian is one of, I think, the leaders in, in humanistic psychology doing this. Doing some incredible work. There's also neurophenomenology. Some very interesting work coming out of neurophenomenology. And this is really looking at that just because we can understand a lot of the things in our brain, it doesn't mean everyone that has the same things going on in the brain are going to have the same experience. We have to understand the experience. We can't reduce experience down to just what's happening in the brain. It can help us understand it. It's vital in helping us understand it. But our subjective experience can also go beyond just what we can see in that way. Advocating for biology as an influence, but not destiny. And this is a perspective that is, psychology is becoming more open to. That we're not just a product of our biology. We, there's interactions that go on there. And then also fighting back against big pharma, which are the, is a great example of the hyper-reductionism that's often seen. Evidence-based practice in psychology. This is one of those words that for humanistic psychologists is often thought of as a dirty word, a dirty idea. And I, I think, in many ways, this is unfortunate. And it's based off of a misunderstanding. This is one of the examples where I think we lost a great opportunity to be a part, a voice in influencing humanistic psychology by not knowing what evidence-based practice was and entering the dialogue before we started to critique it. We just jumped in with critiquing it. This really served us poorly. And when those critiques came out and people realized, well, you're or misunderstanding, then people don't give the respect to humanistic psychology, and we're not able to make as good of critiques. But we need to begin by being engaged in defining what it is. This is one of the things that uh, Wampold, Goodhart, and Levant talked about. Levant was uh, one was the APA president that put forth the commission for the task force on evidence-based practice in psychology, and after the, the findings were published, with Wampold and Goodart, they published something that we have to be active in keeping it broad and inclusive in its definition. If we don't, it's going to become defined how it used to be or defined as the empirically supported treatments were defined. And that's what's happened a lot. So we start off critiquing it as if it was the same thing as empirically supported treatments without understanding that it really was different and more inclusive and fit much better with the humanistic approach. And instead of being a part of keeping that definition broad and exclusive, we weakened our voice by critiquing without understanding. We can't do that. We can't do that. We have to know what we're critiquing. And then we can make a difference. 
And we also need to know how to demonstrate our evidence-based foundation. And there's a lot of resources out there that help to demonstrate that humanistic psychology, existential psychology, transpersonal psychology can be practiced consistent with evidence-based practice in psychology. So we need to make sure that we're understanding it. So we had the premature rebellion. That didn't work well for us. But what I think we can advocate for now is a return to the foundations of evidence-based practice in psychology. I just want to real briefly talk about what this is. There's some articles where you can look at this a little bit more, but I encourage you to go back to the first article in the American Psychologist published by the task force on it. There's three pillars to evidence-based practice in psychology. One is research, but it's broadly defined. This was a noticeable distinction from what you see in the empirically supported treatments. It's broadly defined. It includes qualitative research. It includes research that's not specifically outcome-based. So, research that shows that empathy is effective is part of the research foundation. It's part of the evidence foundations. So we don't have to just do outcome studies to demonstrate the evidence-based foundations in the research perspective. But they clarify that evidence is not an unambiguous term. In other words, it is ambiguous, which is different than empirical and empirically supported treatments. So evidence also includes competencies. And these are very consistent with what we talked about in humanistic psychology. If you read this section, they don't call it competency in there, but if you read this section, it aligns with a lot of competencies. And a lot of those are relational competencies, things that we talk about, that we're experts in. A lot of this is humanistic psychology. You can't say that it's just humanistic psychology, but it's very consistent with this. And then consideration of individual and cultural differences. Well, as I talked about before, we've been weak in this historically, but we're getting better at it, and even starting to show some leadership in it. So when you look at evidence-based practice, this is not that threatening to humanistic psychology, or existential, or transpersonal. If you really understand what it is, we need to go back and advocate for this original definition that's broad and inclusive, and then start showing how we fit with that. If we do that, I think we're going to be a lot more effective in advocating for these approaches should be allowed in some of the agencies that right now say, oh, we don't, we don't allow people to practice humanistic psychology because it's not an evidence-based on the practice. But if you come back and look at this, and you learn how to make the argument, you can go into these agencies and say, hold it, that's not accurate. There's one article that uh, wrote with Lisa Hevelin and Sean Rubin where we talked about, I hope I'm getting that right, yeah, about the... Uh, evidence-based foundations of existential therapy. And I think it can provide a model for how we can continue to do this and build on this. This is also something very important to consider. And actually, it's a you know, wording just back there was a little bit off of this. But in accordance with the seminal article on evidence-based practice in the American Psychologist, no therapeutic approach or modality can be claimed to be an evidence-based practice. It's not, this is not criteria for therapeutic modalities. It's criteria for therapists. And this is, you see all of this literature coming out since that's writing about evidence-based practice not consistent with this. We should be a part of critiquing that. You misunderstand. CPT is not an evidence-based practice. No therapy approach is an evidence-based practice. Rather, when you look at the original article, a competent therapist using a bona fide therapy while considering relevant research and giving consideration for individual and cultural differences can be said to be practicing consistent with evidence-based practice in psychology. I'm going to read that again because I think this is important to keep in mind. A competent therapist using a bona fide therapy while considering relevant research and giving consideration for individual and cultural differences can be said to be practicing consistent with evidence-based practice. You do evidence-based practice. It's not your, your modality, it's you do it. Do you draw on the research? Do you give uh, consideration for individual cultural differences? And do you have an approach that you use that is a that is legitimate approach? Humanistic, existential, transpersonal, and many of the other types of therapy that fall within there are bona fide therapies. And there's research to support it. There's research on empathy, there's research on congruence, there's research on meaning all of these different things. We don't have to be shy about saying that we do evidence-based practice. We can support this. There's the research out there. It's in the journals, the peer-reviewed journals. 
we, we do this. We just don't recognize or say that we do it. And so as I mentioned, Juan Paul Cura and Lovat warned that we were going to regress to being, to being understood the same as empirically supported treatments if there was not intentionality about keeping it more inclusive. They were right, and it happened. And we let it happen in humanistic psychology because we were not speaking out. That was, uh, I think, a, a big mistake. But there is interest in this. When I first presented on this, I was told, people in humanistic psychology and existential trans, they're just not interested in it. I don't think that's true. The first paper that I wrote on this was for APA, with Jason Diaz and uh, Helen Solm. And we put it up on academia.edu afterwards. And if you go on academia.edu and you see, you can tag it. And if you go to existential therapy, I'm not, I haven't looked at this in about a year. But for at least five, six years afterwards, it was the most downloaded and most read article on existential therapy on academia.edu. Now that shows that people are interested in this. This is an important topic to them. And the other paper that I did on this as well, that's on academia.edu, was downloaded. Um, one of the top ones as well, that looked at the cultural aspect of this. So we do know that people are interested in this, that are doing humanistic existential and transpersonal psychology. There's a lot of evidence for that. And we need to be providing opportunities for that. But we still need to do more research as well. And that's the beginning. There's not a lot of uh, outcome research. I think we do need to do some outcome research. That helps strengthen our case. But I don't think we should just rely on the outcome research. There's so many problems with outcome research. When you look at the history of it, one of the things that uh, uh, I always found particularly interesting about this is was a lot of the studies that were comparing, for example, CBT and to another type of therapy is often listed as a supportive therapy. And the supportive therapy often was referred to as humanistic. And who was, in these outcome studies, where they're comparing CBT with a supportive or humanistic therapy, who was doing the supportive humanistic therapy? Anyone know? CBT practitioners. So what those studies really say is not that CBT is more effective than supportive or humanistic therapists, but rather that CBT therapists are better at doing CBT therapy than they are at doing humanistic or supportive therapy. Well, that makes sense, right? I'm a lot better at doing humanistic therapy than I am at CBT, even though I was trained in it. But I don't believe in it. And if you go to some of the research by Wampel, who studies huge meta-analysis, believing in the, what you're doing as a therapist is more predictive of successful, successful outcomes than what you do. The most optimistic views in a lot of these meta-analysis of what amount of change can be accounted for by the techniques is 3.5 to 7 percent. And that's the most optimistic. And even there, it's not specific technique, it's but that you're using the technique, that you're doing something. That's a very small account of the amount of the change that can really be accounted for by techniques. Believing in what you do, the client believing in what you do, that's much more predictive of successful outcomes in therapy. So we don't want to get too obsessed with outcome research. We should do it. We always should be looking at research to see if we can better understand what we're doing and effectiveness of it. But we don't want to just limit ourselves to that. When we do, we're probably going to become less effective. When you look at the research, for example, on empathy, there's a lot of research that shows the effectiveness of empathy. There's a lot of research supporting the, the importance of meaning, of the therapeutic relationship, these different things. Those account for a lot more change, and we need to stay rooted in those. And when we talk about our outcome research, we need to put it in that context, that it's really in that relationship, that is the, the changes occurring. Multiculturalism and social justice, I think, is something that uh, I've mentioned a number of times that we, we need to keep getting more engaged with, staying more engaged with. One thing I try to say often, with my own personal bias, is that if humanistic psychology does not engage multiculturalism and diversity, it will not survive, and it should not. It, it should not. If we are not willing to look at uh, multiculturalism, we should not survive. And this has been part of, of the problem. It's part of why our organizations throughout time so often have been primarily white males. We need to be intentional about this. 
humanistic psychology was early in value in diversity. They talked about it early on. But they failed to actualize it. Now that, particularly as a lot of other approaches to psychology, actualized it much better than humanistic psychology did. And psychology as a whole wasn't great about it for a long time and is still struggling with it. But we were not as good as a lot of other approaches at this. That should have been reason for pause and reflection about why did we value it early on, we weren't successful, and all these other approaches were much more successful. And a book that a few of us are working on, uh, we've got a, a chapter in there by Geneva Agabico, and it's on humanistic psychology and, and diversity that we hope will be out in about a year and a half, and we're just publishing it. And uh, this was a chapter that I really wanted in the book from, the, from when we first started thinking about it. And she's a, a colleague that was trained in humanistic psychology and left it. And so I had some really interesting conversations with her about why she left humanistic psychology. And she's a, a Latina woman, and she just said, you know, it didn't speak to who I was. What, what humanistic psychology was talking about were not the things that, were, that I was interested in. Those were ignored. And so she left humanistic psychology, so she wrote a, a nice chapter on why I left humanistic psychology. And it's something that we need to listen to. And through my years of being involved in the Society for Humanistic Psychology, particularly uh, when I'm on the board, I've heard stories like that over and over again. There has to be intentionality about being inclusive, about being diverse, otherwise it's not going to happen. Lisa gave a, a great talk about this yesterday, and I think we'll be talking about some of that again today. We have to stay intentional about it. And when we've let that slip, we've seen the regressions in humanistic psychology. We have to stay a, a consistent in our intentionality. And we must be willing to consider and adapt even our most basic foundations if we are truly authentically to embrace multiculturalism. This is the part where, I, when I've said this in the past, where I lose a lot of humanistic psychologists. I don't know, don't mess with our foundations. We can't do that. But if our foundations can't be adapted, can't be applied with people from different cultures, then there's something wrong with it. We need to be willing to, to consider, reconsider and adapt these. That's vital. It, and we need to recognize that it's, it's something that needs to be adapted. For a number of years, it's been very much a part of, of doing trainings in existential psychology in China. Right? Motes has been a, a part of that for, for a number of years and very involved with it. And I know Ian does some stuff in Southeast Asia now too. When you do humanistic psychology in these very different cultural contexts, there are adaptations. There are different ways that you have to do it. And it's also a great way to learn about your approach to therapy. There are many things that were just assumptions for me, just a given for me. <clears throat> in my approach to existential therapy. And when I started doing it in, in China, and doing demonstrations, and people, whoa, you can't do that here. It's a great opportunity to reflect on, okay, this is not working here. Does this mean it doesn't, it can't fit in this culture? Does it mean it needs to be adapted in this culture? And for the most part, what we've always found is that it can be adapted for the culture. But you're doing it in different ways. Through that, it deepens one's understanding of the therapeutic approach dramatically. Where therapy doesn't work is vital for us in, in learning. And the multicultural dialogues and the international dialogues really can help us get a deeper understanding of how we can advance humanistic psychology. Because it can't stay how it is now. It's got to grow. There's a reason why in the last 10 years we've started to, to finally overcome this barrier and, and start to become more diverse. Because we've been doing some things differently. Now some of these things that we've been doing differently early on were very heavily critiqued. Um, you were there yesterday, you heard me say that when I first started presenting on this, it was very common, it was almost the norm, that after I gave a presentation at a conference on uh, multiculturalism and diversity from humanistic and existential perspectives, or, or multiculturalism, how multiculturalism and diversity should impact humanistic and existential therapy, there'd be someone that was angry, either speaking up or cornering me after the conversation often red in the face, they're so angry, or sending me angry emails. There was one time uh, I had about 10 to 12 angry emails from the same person within about two days. Saying, I don't know how you can present on this. You're changing who we are. Well, if it is changing who we are, we need to think about that. And whether, if we aren't willing to, to consider, reconsider and adapt, to critique even our foundations, 
then we're not being very authentic in our embracing of the multicultural perspectives. <clears throat> And as I mentioned this already, as the history of humanistic psychology is demonstrating, valuing is not enough. We have to remain intentional about being more diverse and open, and, and open to recognizing our failures. We have to do this. Um, we spent a wonderful six hours yesterday talking about humanistic psychology <clears throat> and applying it with uh, marginalized and oppressed groups. And, I think it did a nice job of illustrating a number of the challenges that we have to, to continue to look at. But we have to keep being intentional like that. But being intentional is not enough. There are, we have to be, in, be willing to, to broaden that intentionality. If we only work to help the suffering of individuals representing diversity, but do not address the system, we are enabling an oppressive system. There's been some, uh, I think, very important critiques of psychology in general and of humanistic psychology in particular regarding this. Critical psychology has done this. And uh, I'm going to blank the name of the, the book, um, the, the author, Dave Tillman, and his book, We've Got 100 Years of Psychotherapy and the World's Getting Worse. Wonderful little book and great title. But in, in these sources, and as well as some others, it's been talked about it. If all we're doing is helping someone become more comfortable in an oppressive system, then we are actually supporting the system more than the individual. We're enabling the system to continue to be oppressive. We can't do that. We have to address the systemic issues. We have to address systemic racism. Sitting with your clients that are struggling with racism and microaggressions and prejudices is not enough. It's a good thing to do. It's important. But it's not enough if we let the system stay. So how can we speak to the system and to the individual? This is something that we need, uh, we need to talk about. We need to consider. One of the papers that we worked on, again, with Lisa and uh, Nathaniel Granger and, and Mike Motes here in the back, as we, a couple of years ago, um, was asked to write a, a paper on, uh, for a special edition of the Journal of Humanistic Psychology on Social Justice. And so we took the opportunity to write a paper on existential perspectives on the Black Lives Matter movement. I think we can do more things like this and look at how and what can we learn from these movements and what, how can we, through an existential lens, understand these movements and maybe even help support these movements. I think that's important. The American Psychological Association uh, is hesitant about this. When the APA convention was in Denver a couple of years ago, there was a very large Black Lives Matter uh, a protest where we, we walked sort of walked. It was something like, a, well, I wish I could remember, it's, uh, I posted something about it uh, a long time ago, but it, it was about 40% or maybe more of the people attending the convention that participated in this, which was great to see and to go along. And they had a number of presentations at the end. And in one of the presentations, they talked about how they had asked APA to support the event. And APA said, no, we won't do that because we don't support activism. We're, we do act, advocacy, not activism. I, I think that might have been a little bit of a cop-out. And APA has done some similar things to that. But uh, I think we need to be able to, to look beyond that and how can we be involved in social justice. Multiculturalism without social justice cannot actualize its potential. Lisa talked about this uh, yesterday as well. Um, that multiculturalism without social justice it cannot actualize its potential. We need to do both. And internationalizing. We are becoming a global society, and speaking to multiculturalism in the United States is not enough. So we need to keep looking beyond. There's a difference between multiculturalism in the United States and internationalizing. There's different issues. In the United States, that social justice component right now, in particular, is so important to it. In other cultures, there's different needs that might be the priority at the, at the particular time. But we learn different things from engaging in these, but we need to be able to recognize that there's a difference between these. We need both, and we need to be able to honor these differences. 
that we need connection between the local and the national. That's why it's great, and we're intentional about having this conference before the Society for Humanistic Psychology Conference. It's a positioning it in a way for us to connect with the national organization, and we work closely with them. That we have a number of people that are on our board and on that board. Uh, they're providing the, the continuing education for this conference and our events. We have a, an agreement where they will continue to offer continuing education for our events. I think this is important. There needs to be a connection between the national and the international, and between the local and the international. And this is something that our, our board is talking about again, about some uh, opportunities to connect internationally. And one of our uh, members and a friend for, for many of us here in, in Colorado is Mark Yang, who lives in Beijing, uh, but has a lot of close connections here and uh, been working together for a number of years. But he's reaching out saying, hey, is there ways that we can connect your local organization to the work that he's doing in Beijing? That maybe provide opportunities so that at future RMHCPA conferences, we may be having people from China come and be a part of them and have people that are involved with this organization that go and do trainings in China. Now, this is still early in the conversation, so we don't know for sure it's going to happen, but it's one of the things that I think needs to happen. While it's good to have the national and the international connections, sometimes it's more powerful when we can have these two local groups connecting. There can be a little more intimacy with that, and also we can get away from a little bit of the politics of it. So I think this is a very exciting possibility. Uh, mentioned a lot of this before, but internationally, I think we learn to recognize a lot of our biases and, and limitations, and we also learn alternatives. The, the dialogues that have happened in recent years between the United States and particularly China, but also other places in Southeast Asia, about existential psychology, I think have really enriched our understanding of existential psychology. And we've also identified what we're referring to as indigenous Chinese existential approaches to therapy. And there are a couple of them that I've talked about. Just as one example is Jermin therapy, which was developed by Shui Fu Wang based on the works of a Chinese literary figure, Wu Xi. And he developed it not as an existential therapy, he developed it largely off the works of Wu Xi. And after he had developed this approach to therapy, one of his colleagues in China said, You know, what you're doing sounds a lot like it's existential therapy. And so when we had a chance to meet at a conference and talking, we really saw that. Yeah, there's a lot of similarities here. And there's a lot of ways that we can, can work together and we can form each other. And so there's been a couple of articles that he's written now that are in English. Uh, I hope over time we can translate more of his works into English. They're looking at this Jermian approach and, and how it's relevant to uh, existential psychology in the United States. So I think this is exciting possibilities that we have. So in conclusion, I think humanistic psychology can have a really bright future. There's a lot that we have uh, going for us, but we must be thoughtful and intentional about how we approach the future and how we think about that. Times are changing. But you can just see in the last couple of years how much things have changed in the United States <coughs> and how it's impacted our clients. That I, Having practiced for 20 years now, I've never had so many clients coming in talking about what's happening in, in the culture around them. It's astonishing how many people are coming and talking about what's happening in the culture around us. And it's not surprising when you start looking at it a little bit more deeply about why this is. But we have to be intentional in thinking about that and what that means for us. I believe the Rocky Mountain community, and more specifically, the Rocky Mountain Humanistic Counseling and Psychological Association, can be a bright part of this future. And that's why we created this organization. We wanted it as I noted before, to be a community here, to be something, uh, a source of support. Doing this work is not easy. Whether you're doing humanistic psychology and you're the only person that's uh, in your uh, place of work doing that, and you don't have the other connections, whether it's uh, hearing the, the pushback from other organizations, whether it's doing the work with multiculturalism, diversity, and social justice, which can be incredibly uh, emotionally consuming when we start to engage all of the things, ways that this is impacting us. With all of these, we need that community to support each other. But when we have that, when we have a strong local community where we can get together and support each other emotionally, where we can get together and share ideas, where we can get together and test out new ideas and, 
and work together, build new collaborations and networking, then we can start to develop the things that can help advance and change humanistic psychology. We need the local to be able to do that. We need that strong local community. And I think this is the start of that. And I hope this conference is the start of that. So I hope you join us on this journey, being part of the organization. We'd love for more people to get more involved. We have openings on our board and a number of committees. We're wanting to do more training. So if you have something you want to do trainings on, we can talk about whether we can partner on that. But we want it to be an organization that really is making a difference in our community, in humanistic psychology, and well beyond that in our culture. Thank you. And I just wanted to ask one specific question. Uh, at one point you had mentioned the difficulty we have with the teaching of psychology at the undergraduate level. You know, we're both involved in teaching at the graduate level, but boy, we're really being undercut at the undergraduate level. I remember Krishna Kumar looked into this quite a bit, uh, as well as some other folks in Division 32. And so I'm just kind of wondering, uh, given the state of things, as you said, um, what kind of solutions do you think we might uh, go after to try and fix this? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think I could offer a number of things. But, um, one is, I think it needs to be an important aspect in our humanistic institutions and our transpersonal institutions where we need to, to think about preparing people to go out and teach. But so often we, we don't think about that aspect and uh, preparing people how to teach and to have the credentials to teach. Right now, it's tough to get into uh, to academia sometimes. And so if we provide opportunities to be able to uh, build one's vita in a way that uh, positions them to be able to teach, I think that's an important thing. We can do that at our universities, Europa, Sabra, Point Park, these other universities where there's a, a strong humanistic presence. But we can also do that through organizations like this. It's one of the reasons why we wanted to make sure there's student awards, why there are um, student poster opportunities, opportunities for students to present, so that you can, through this organization, start to build your vita, start to get more comfortable presenting so that you can apply for those teaching positions down the way. Even if it's not full time, if you're looking to adjunct here and there. But we need more people that are interested in going out and teaching introduction to psychology courses. There's a, a book that was written by Rich Bardgill and Roger Bromay on Humanistic Contributions to Psychology 101. I know Lisa was one of the contributors to that. I don't know if anyone else in here was. But it's a, it's a, what it's intended to be is a supplementary textbook for introduction to psychology courses. Where you normally have humanistic psychology, all the contributions relevant to a general psychology or entry to psychology left out. So it's designed as a book that you can use in conjunction with a traditional textbook that talks about the humanistic contributions to the different fields. I've been talking with Rich, I think we need to update the book now. It's been about, uh, how many years has it been out? Four years, maybe? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, out for, I think, two. Out for two, okay, so two years. It's being used in more places, but there's some things with it being out have learned. I think there's one chapter missing in there, a multicultural chapter, I think needs to be added to it. But, uh, you know, the, from the beginning, the intention was for that to be updated after a couple of years, and I think that's uh, something that needs to happen. But it's a great opportunity. And so, uh, even if you're not teaching, if you know people that are teaching uh, Introduction to Psychology, mention that book to them. Now, I have to acknowledge my uh, relationship with that book, uh, in full disclosure, is that it was published by University Professors Press, which I work with that, that press. And uh, I don't say that just to promote a book by University Professors Press. This is something that was part of, in the vision, when we first started University Professors Press. Another thing is, uh, I mentioned this uh, to some degree in the talk before, we need to be writing the authors of these books and telling them, hey, you know, you should consider including this in there. Hey, you were a little bit off on this. 
writing the publishers, writing authors, raising their consciousness about this can help. And so if, if they start receiving a lot of letters, it starts to make a difference. It's one of the things I <coughs> suggested to the Society of Community Psychology cautiously because often you suggest something you're asked to do it, and I can't do this. But if there's someone here interested in it, what I would love to see is a working group. Um, and I'm pretty, Donna Rockwell is currently the president. The next president is Nathaniel Granger, who's on our board here. So I'm guessing they would, would support this. I would love to see a task force that is reviewing the introductory textbooks and, and general psychology as well as others and finding those errors and then developing letters that people can send. So when we have this, we can have a template where a number of people can send to the publisher, hey, you might think about this and to the author. If we start doing this in larger groups, the pressure to start to represent humanistic psychology more accurately, I think, is going to change. To have it in there. So I think there's some things like that that we can do, ranging from uh, kind of the more specific to the more, more general. And you may have other ideas as well. <laughs> I think you hit all the ones I could, but they are wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Kind of going off of that, but a little bit of a tangent, I'm curious about um, outreach kind of beyond uh, the psychology of humanism and existentialism. So when I think about it as a clinician, attracting clients who would be interested in this kind of approach, not everybody understands it. So how do we make this, like the philosophy of humanism and existentialism more accessible to people and to sort of out in that understanding of the community. Yeah. I think Lisa has great expertise on that and has been helping consult with people around this. So uh, I think she could probably give a lot of answers more than what I could. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, when we put it on our websites, I don't think we should shy away from using our specific labels, but we shouldn't rely on them too much. We need to explain what we do in, in lay terms as much as possible. But I, and that's typically what I've always done. Um, I don't have any problem getting more than enough clients. I just practice one day a week now because I teach full time. But um, my waiting list has been 10 to 12 people long for most of the time recently. Some of those people come because uh, I say I'm an existential therapist. Many of them come because they, um, I'm on the insurance panel. Some, but a lot of them will look at the profile that I have and, oh, that seems like the approach that I want to, to do. And those are the clients I try to prioritize, find time to work with. But there's a lot of um, myths out there about you can't do this type of work, advertise this type of work. You just have to find a way to do it, a creative way to do it, and I think it is, it is possible. But we have to, I don't think it's good for us to shy away from our terms. It's not it's authentic to do that. But we can't over-rely upon them to do all the work for us. And we can't expect others, even in the field of psychology, to know what it is that we do, because most of them have taken these undergraduate psychology courses that tremendously distort humanistic psychology. So we have to be able to talk about what we do. And, you know, I, I will often use a language that, that it's a very relational approach. Um, relational can mean so many different things, and it's a buzzword sometimes now in therapy. Um, but I think that is one thing that some clients relate to, um, that uh, I talk about believing the importance of the therapeutic relationship. Um, I talk in different ways about kind of a non-pathologizing approach, which a lot of people really like. And because uh, there some people in one therapy, but they don't want a diagnosis. So some of these different things, as we learn to, to tweak our language, then we can, can be more successful. Anything you want to add, Lisa? Um, yeah. Basically, don't make it too complicated. Like if a, if a child can't understand it, then their clients probably aren't going to understand it. So figure out ways to make it really accessible and speak to their pain and their need, as opposed to your expertise and what you offer. So like, what is the problem that they're coming to you with, and how can you help them? We can talk more after. Good. Good. All right. Well, I don't want to come into Ian's time here, so let's uh, turn it over to Ian.